we're continuing our sermon series this, this month on thirst. We started last week with the thirst for community. Today we're going to be talking about the thirst for meaning. Next Sunday, Bishop Carlton Pierce is going to be speaking on the thirst for wholeness. Thirst for wholeness. So come on back for that. But first we need to quench our thirst for meaning. Because our minds can have knowledge, our bookshelves can have books, all the information of the universe could be a couple of computer clicks away, and yet we can still be parched of meaning. We can hunger for meaning in our jobs, in our relationships, at the bedside of a loved one who is dying. What does it all mean? All other animals seem to know what they're supposed to be doing. And they don't seem to easily go about living their purpose in this creation. But we, the featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creatures that we are, are not always sure what we're supposed to be doing. And yet, we do try to figure it out. We are meaning-making creatures. And there are endless cliches that we've all heard about the search for meaning. We could see them in cartoons in The New Yorker, for example. There's one where the subject is a middle-aged man who's in a toga carrying a wooden staff. He's clearly on a pilgrimage, and he's arrived at a fork in the road. And the signs, there's two arrows. One's pointing to the meaning of life, and the other one is pointing to cheese and crackers. And he's scratching his chin trying to decide, and he looks pretty hungry. It's a relevant question whether we're really compelled to discover the meaning of life, or whether we're content just enjoying the snacks before we die. Are we thirsty for meaning or just hungry for happiness? And are we willing to settle for escape? Another cartoon has two ladies sitting on the couch. One of them looks miserable. And she's saying, if indeed there's a reason for all of this, then that makes it so much worse. (laughs) We all see the news every day. The unremitting succession of wars and murder, rapes, domestic abuse, theft, death, destruction, deception, and disease. Life from some angles is mostly a tale of war and bloodshed and disasters and adject poverty. And the idea that there's a reason for all of this, and even a God who would create it and deem it good, may seem like the most perverse joke of them all. It's easier perhaps to live knowing that there is no meaning to all of this than it is to discover that It was created this way for a purpose. And a third cartoon has a fashionable young cosmopolitan lady, clearly from New York, beautifully proportioned and standing before the proverbial guru in the cave. And she's holding her designer purse and has freshly applied lipstick. And she's saying, I'd like to know the meaning of life. That is, if it's not too yucky. Now, there are those who are willing to seek life's meaning, but only if they can be guaranteed a positive answer. In other words, they'd rather live an illusion or a fantasy or a fallacy if the other option is to discover that this life may be pretty hard and pretty difficult. A bumper sticker I once saw asked this existential question in a very different way. It's asked, what if the hokey pokey is what it's all about? What if there's no intrinsic meaning to this life other than the meaning that we create? My colleague Forrest Church, he always used to say the reason that we seek meaning, the reason that we are religious creatures is because of the dual reality that we face of being alive and knowing that we're going to die. In in the words of my professor, the colorful Cornell West, 
from whom I took the phrase describing us as featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creatures, but he adds, who all enter the world between urine and feces. (laughs) Through the love push of our mother. Think about it. We begin in that funk And soon enough, we will become the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. It's a pretty earthy existence. And pretty humbling, really. In the meantime, we find ourselves searching for a way to make sense of it all on this journey from the womb to the tomb. And to consider what kind of legacy we might leave and what kind of relationship and responsibility we have to those who've gone before us. This thrusts us into the Socratic questions of, am I leading a life worth living? Who am I, what do I want to be, and what is the source of my hope? None of which are questions for the faint of heart. Because if the answer we find is that we are not leading a life worth living, Our options are few. We can continue to live a worthless life. We can end our life. Or we can try to change the way that we're living. And that, of course, is the most courageous decision of them all. Clearly, the stakes are high. And the temptation of the man at the crossroads is real. Do I really want to face such a proposition? Or shall we all just have some cheese and crackers? And maybe a little wine to wash it down to forget about all this stuff. (laughs) Of course, the society around us is constantly distracting us from asking these questions. We are constantly being bombarded by market-driven messages about what we should be doing and what a good life looks like, what a good wife looks like. We're told, be successful, gain status, climb the social hierarchy, enjoy the snacks of life through money and power and prestige. Dr. West says, a market-driven world puts a premium on conformity, on going about one's own business in one's own isolated, individualistic, hedonistic way, holding at arm's length community, holding at arm's length public interest, holding at arm's length the common good and somehow trying to just live large in some vanilla suburb. Our market-driven world compels us to live in our own little bubble, hoping not to have our prejudices challenged too much. To live an examined life is to engage in the formation of attention. It's about confronting reality, not escaping from it, even if it's yucky. It's about remembering our mortality and our humble beginnings. And since we will not be here that long, we need to decide with wisdom and with courage who we want to be. We need to decide if we are going to be true to ourselves or follow the herd. It's about asking the right questions. As Thomas Pynchon noted, if they can get us asking the wrong questions, then they don't have to worry about the answers. It's not really a question of does life in general have meaning, it's a question of does my life have meaning? Does our particular life have meaning? And if you're not interested in living these questions, and you'd prefer to go to a church or a mosque that will tell you with great assurance why you are here, how you got here, what you're supposed to do, and where you are going after you die, then you're in the wrong place. This community is not about spoon-feeding people answers. It's about making sure that we're asking the right questions and being a community who support each other to courageously live into the answers that we find. (laughs) 
you are also in the wrong place if you're not awake to the fact that by not answering these questions, you are at the whim and the mercy of people and corporations that are spending millions and billions of dollars every day to try to market and make money from you by creating desires in you that you don't even have. And who are using highly refined and sophisticated techniques to convince you that doing what they want you to do and buying what they want you to buy, that it will make you happy. And it will make your life satisfying. On the one hand, we have religions trying to tell us exactly what we're supposed to do, what we're supposed to know and who we are. And on the other hand, we have the market, which is trying to confuse us and convince us that we want what's gonna make somebody else rich. But here we're interested in the formation of attention, which is very Buddhist in fact. But we're also interested and not afraid to challenge the status quo, which is very Christian. Right. Although this Christianity has become the status quo in so many ways, so I will rephrase that and say challenging the status quo is very Christ-like. Buddhism is full of techniques to help us to learn how to pay attention. Spirituality in Western religion can often be focused too much on speaking to God and telling God what we want, whereas Buddhism is more about listening for the spirit within. And meditation is a practice about learning how to pay attention. And we have a great meditation class here every Wednesday night at All Souls if you want to learn meditation from some masters. Now Christianity, however, is based on the story of Jesus who spent his life challenging the status quo of his culture, of his society, and of his religion. He said, don't seek success through power and prestige and position. He says, be great. He, and he explains that the greatest among you will be a servant. The greatest among you will keep track of the least of these in society. The greatest among you will be the one who attempts to love God by learning how to love your neighbor and even love your enemies. This was countercultural then and it still is now. The entire notion of Christianity is built on the idea that the things that was rejected becomes the cornerstone of building a new and just world. The world that Jesus lived in was dominated by kingdoms that ruled with violence and do dominance and wealth. Jesus proposed a different kind of kingdom. He called it the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, which turned everything that everybody knew and everybody believed about life and power and meaning on its head. Forrest Church talks about this in his book on universalism called The Cathedral of the World. He explains that Jesus tells us that the kingdom of God is never where you think to look for it. The kingdom of God is in the mustard seed, the least pretentious of seeds. The kingdom of God is not revealed in the good son, but in the prodigal son. It is revealed through prostitutes and tax collectors. It is revealed through a Samaritan, who by the way was the one who was the most prejudiced against in his time and in his culture. Now depending on your prejudices today, the Samaritan might be the Muslim, or the undocumented immigrant, or the felon, or a redneck. Whoever you and the people around you are most prejudiced against is the one who has the most to teach you according to Jesus. The kingdom of God is revealed where you least expect it. Your thirst for community, for meaning, for wholeness, for justice will be quenched, not in the ways you often expect, but in the least likely of ways. You will not find the people, you will not find it in the people who are just like you, or the ones who are manufactured on a screen to make you like them, but you will find them in people who are different from you, who you have the courage to get to know and get to share your life with and share your truth with. 
Jesus went around offering free healing. Anyone who comes to me can be healed, he announced. It did not have to be mediated through patronage and clientage. You do not have to work through his friends and disciples and pay them money. This was a radical shift from how people related to one another in his time. He teaches, if you are looking for life's meaning, expect it where you least expect it. Stay humble. Remember how we all enter this world through our mother's love push. And keep in mind where we're headed in the short time that we have. So that you don't take on airs. And you don't follow the herd. And don't become blind and indifferent to those living on the margins of society. But actually pay attention to them. And to their suffering. And to what they have to teach you. Jesus was not just about free healing, but also about common eating. He ate with those who were considered unclean, with non-Jews, with street people, with tax collectors. This was a radical break from the status quo. Cuisine is predicated on hierarchy. Different classes eat different kinds of food. And the majority of people don't have access to the cuisine of the well-to-do. They're not invited to eat it. And they can't afford it. And Jesus comes along and says, anyone can come to my table. Whosoever will, let them come. He says, I will dine with those who have trouble finding a meal. Here at All Souls, we're inviting everyone in this congregation who is not currently living on the SNAP program, the the um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which used to be called um, Food Stamps. Those of us who are not living on that program are invited this month in September to live for a week on that amount of money that is given, which is $4.23 a day or $29 for food for the week. Now, we're going to do it. Our ministers are going to do it. And I know a few dozen of our members have said they're going to do it, but I want to know how many. If you're going to do it as well, if you're thinking about it, I want you to let us know in the office because the Tulsa World contacted me. They heard about this and they said, we think this is pretty special. A congregation of people in this community who are trying to understand what it's like to live with food insecurity in this state. And so they, they want to know, and I'd love to be able to tell them next week, yeah, not only are our ministers doing it, but a hundred of our members, or whatever number, are going to do it. But I'll tell you something before you make the decision. Some people who have already started doing it this month have been catching some flack on Facebook. Yeah, people sort of saying, that's all right, you can talk back. This is a contemporary service. We, we, we do that a little bit. But... You know, people who don't understand, why are you doing that? That doesn't make any sense. But for me, as I try on my best days to reach and follow the moral teachings of Jesus, it seems like exactly the right thing to do. And I'm going to tell you what I learned from it, as well as Reverend Barbara Prose on the last Sunday of this month in our messages on thirst for justice. Now today, though, it's all about thirst for meaning, and I want to end by reiterating that we often find it where we least expect it. And if we're looking for a criteria to judge whether the meanings that we're living by, the meanings that we're making or discovering are worthy of our life, I would say we should judge those meanings that we make and discover by their impact. By their fruits, you shall know them. They sh the meanings that we live by should bear fruit for others, not just for ourselves. Here's a story that, for me, sums it up very well, everything that I've been saying. This summer, I went to Guatemala on a school-building trip named after my daughter, Sienna, who died when she was three years old. Now, as I told this story 
about the project to our Day Alliance at a lunch earlier this week, I explained how hundreds of children have been impacted already by the 10 schools that have been created. And because it's education, we know that this will have an influence for generations to come. The fact that this project was inspired by her life and her untimely death give her life and her death meaning. I have watched how her very short life has impacted the world positively in ways that even people who live well into their 90s may never do. And so the meaning of her story is not just the worst tragedy that my family ever faced or the greatest pain and loss that I've had to endure. No, the meaning of her life also includes that even though it was short, it continues to leave a legacy of love and possibility and hope for others long after she's gone. Thank you. Her life has been planted like a seed and is bearing fruit. How about your life? Are you planting your life like a seed so that it can bear fruit? So that people who you may never know, who will be born long after you're gone, can rest under the shade of the trees that you've planted? What kind of life are you living What kind of legacy are you leaving? Will it mean something to others that you lived? At the crossroads of life, we often find a sign with arrows pointing in two different directions. One says the meaning of life. The other says comfort. In my experience, we can rarely have both. Are you willing to live into the discomfort of being part of a community of people who are on a walk, not filled with assurance about every answer that that we have, but who are willing to live the questions together in love and with purpose and to make a difference with our lives before we leave this life? God bless you. I love you.